17th, 2001, a Board of School Directors meeting for Muffley Roxbury um, School District. Um, let's just do a roll. Advocate? Here. Jerry? Here. Emma? Here. Jill? Jill? It didn't work. Here. Okay. Uh, Kristen? Here. Mia? Here. And I know Andrew is going to be late. Um, I'm not sure where Amanda is, but let's go ahead and start as we've got uh, quorum. Um, Amanda did ask for a quick discussion about um, whether someone wanted to uh, monitor a board working group of, for the uh, student waiting committee. Um, so I want to just add that quickly to the agenda just to spend um, you know, a couple of minutes to see if there's any volunteer. Um, and if there is, a monitor I can pass along information uh, on that. Um, but first order of business is public comment. Uh, and please, um, if you do want to make public comment, uh, either raise your hand in the participant column on Zoom, um, or if you're having trouble figuring that out, uh, you can just uh, wave your hand in general. And I'm not sure we have many members from the public who aren't media. So let's assume we don't have public comment. Um, and move on to the consent agenda. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Great. Uh, any discussion? All right, we'll do roll. Uh, Advocate? Aye. Barry? Aye. Um, Emma? Aye. Jill? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Uh, Mia? Aye. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, so I will just um, quickly before I have um, the BSBA come, I'm very excited for their presentation. Uh, I just wanted to raise the issue that, that Amada wanted to put on the agenda. Um, as you know, the uh, UVM did a study uh, as on the way we weight students for the way we finance our schools. If you remember from budgeting period, um, the equalized pupil number is one of three factors that goes into how uh, states the state allocates money to districts. Um, basically, the long and the short of it is that the study found that the uh, weighting system uh, did not account for particularly smaller uh, rural populations in a way that was equitable. Um, so the, the legislature has been giving thought to um, how to adjust that uh, scale. My understanding is that um, while um, there's robust discussion and definitely a desire to do something to ensure that the weighting scale is more equitable. Um, action is probably not likely um, until uh, next legislative session. However, there is a board working group um, that is being coordinated by Maggie Lenz, who is a lobbyist who um, is uh, supporting action on, on the weighting issue. Uh, so if anybody wants to monitor that for the board, uh, I think they're meeting kind of semi-regularly on Thursday nights. Um, just reach out to Libby or me and we can um, send you that information. We'll also let the rest of the board know that someone's on that. If someone wants to volunteer now, great. But um, if you want to think about it, uh, uh, there's definitely room for that. Um, do you want to say that that the uh, initial analysis of the waiting study indicated that we lose would lose several students? Um, so I think while this is a huge equity measure that needs to happen statewide, um, 
one thing we may want to think about is is how it the, the impact of it can be uh, kind of phased in over time, so we're not suddenly left with uh, a huge budget gap. Um, so uh, that's that, and uh, very happy to have uh, Sue Holson and Sue. I'm going to butcher your last name. Saglowski. Saglowski uh, from the Vermont uh, School Boards Association here to do um, a training on uh, just kind of the basics of board role and uh, uh, just kind of board role 101. Um, so they're going to give, I think, a brief overview and then have some times for Q and A. So please, um, you know, ask away once once their presentation is done. But I will, I will turn it over to the the two of you. And again, thank you for for making time to. Oh. We're happy to be here. I've met some of you before, but not all of you. I'm Susan Holson. I'm the Director of Education Services at VSBA and Sue Saglowski, who's here with us tonight also. You got, you got the A team here, is the Executive Director. And she is also the attorney. So in case any legal questions come up, I'm not allowed to answer them. Um, so she'll be here to, to sort of back up on that stuff. Um, before we get started, first of all, I, I don't know, Libby, can you allow me to share my screen? Is you should be able to. Uh, can you? No, host disabled participant screen sharing. Well, let me just make that. Thanks. Um, and while Libby's doing that, I, I, I'm going to say we're going to race through uh, what Jim referred to as board 101. We do have our annual spring training for new and almost new board members that will be uh, running two evenings as a webinar, four hours total, two evenings in May. You, If you haven't already received notification of that, you will from VSBA. Uh, so I would really encourage anybody who has been on the board either just recently elected, or I know you've had a lot of transition on the board and a lot of appointments in, in this particular uh, board. And so we invite you all to come and participate. Um, I, I think that's a different kind of dynamic because you'll be with a lot of people who also are have sort of that deer in the headlights thing about what school board work is. Um, so. I will, if I can now. Oh, I can. Thank you. Um, now, how do I do this? I'm getting there. Bear with me, please. Okay. So Zoom is great, except it doesn't allow me to see what I'm doing. So it's kind of an interesting challenge here. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay, we're getting there. Okay, um, so I, as Jim said, we're gonna end um, with a case study, which is also really designed to tease out your questions and your thoughts about what's going on. So I invite questions as we go, but if you wanna just sort of get the overview and then we'll work with it, that's fine too. Um, and I can't see you, so just jump in, okay? Uh, based on conversations with Libby and with Jim, what we're really gonna outline tonight are the roles and responsibilities of the board based on um, Vermont law what governance is all about, the essential work of Vermont school boards, which is a tool that we, the Vermont School Boards Association, has um, created to help guide you through the work of the board. We'll talk a little bit about 
board operations, and then we'll, we'll address a case study. So I want to start by just making clear that school boards are actually a creation of legislature. And the powers of the school boards are listed in 16 BSA section 563. And I'm not going to take time to go through all of this because as you can see, there's a lot of them. But what that all says is there are 32 powers of boards outlined in that statute, including, and I just, these are the highlights to me, determining what your educational policies look like, assuring sound fiscal management and accountability, and preparing and distributing an annual budget. Um, boards are required, based on these statutory references, um, to comply with Vermont's open meeting law. And uh, we're not going to dive into that deeply tonight because we just don't have time, but we're happy to talk to you about that anytime if you have questions about it. And also boards are bound to use Robert's rules of order to run your meetings. Um, and boards also are required to have a conflict of interest policy, which you do. So that's sort of the legislative piece um, and the genesis of where school board activity starts. Uh, the photo here is a, a picture of the Vermont Education Law Book, which is something that we publish and update annually. As you can see, I have not updated my picture to match <laughs> uh, where we are. They look the same other than the the year on the cover. And it gets updated every year by our office um, to reflect changes in legislation. And so the 2020 edition has just come out. And if I'm sure there's a copy in the central office, but it may be something that is worthwhile for some of you to have. And just let us know if, if that is something that you want us to get to you. Now we talk a lot about governance when we talk about school boards and if, until I was on a board, I didn't know what governance was. And in fact, I'm not sure I knew for a long time after I was on the board either. Um, and so I, I went to Miriam Webster and they broke their own rule by using their definition or, or using the word in the definition, the act of or process of governing. <laughs> um, so I looked up govern and they specifically talk about a uh, policy level, making an administration of policy. And, and that's what governance is about. It's about high level oversight. Um, and so we're gonna talk about today the, the distinction between government governance and management, which is more operational typically. Um, so effective governance boards and this is a composite from a lot of research that's been done, but if board members and administrative team agree on the what the principles of governance are and the habits of effective governance, you're off to a good start. And also commit them yourselves to making sure that you all understand the same basics. That's a good place to start. When governance isn't working, uh, board members usually think that they're just rubber stamping decisions that the executive team is making and the administration usually thinks that the board is micromanaging. And so you can see there's a disconnect there and, and that's when things really start to fall apart. So the relationship, and we'll talk more about this, the relationship between the superintendent and the board is critical. It's critical for your kids, for your students. That's really the the point at which the big picture and the oversight ties in with operations. It's that, that collaboration. And so that's got to be working well. I have a two minute video that I want to share with you. This comes from um, our colleagues in Texas. And it's just a little animated thing. I apologize if some of you have seen it before, but I think it explains the role of a school board very succinctly and then we'll get into more nitty-gritty let me know if you have trouble hearing this please it's a little quiet yeah i'm having trouble as well i can't hear it at all you're not hearing that 
Okay, hold on. Let's see what I can figure out. Did you share your computer audio when you shared your screen? That's a good question. Let For me, me the you. audio was coming through. It was just the volume was very low. Yeah, and it's blasting my ears out. So um, that's going to be a problem. I think the volume we might have heard was just coming from like ambient from her microphone. Instead. Okay. Oh, could be. I got it now. Thanks. Let's, we'll try this again. Thank you all for your explanations there. My name is Rachel and I'm in the sixth grade. Better? I was invited yep. to go to a school board meeting to get an award, but I didn't know what the school board did. So I asked my grandpa Freddie since he used to be on the board. He said, well, school boards are kind of like the grandparents of the school. schools. They want good things for the students and staff. Even though grandparents aren't always around, we do our best to help you learn and grow. Let me see if I can explain it in another way. Think of the school board team as building a bridge between the community and the schools. They are your voice. Board members listen to parents, community members, school staff, and even the students about their hopes and dreams for their schools. They share these messages with the superintendent and other school leaders, and they advocate for their school district by speaking up for them with other elected officials and within the community. Another important job of the board is to provide direction for the schools. School board members choose a destination for the district. They might like the students to go to Topeka, Kansas, Paris, France, or even Mars. But they don't tell the staff how to get there. They empower the superintendent, staff, and students to choose their path. The board also makes a lot of decisions, like hiring a superintendent. The superintendent is the leader who makes sure the daily operations of the schools run well. The superintendent helps determine the best routes on the map, along with the staff and students. The school board also ensures that resources are in place so that the staff can complete their work and make sure students can reach their destinations. Let's say that the schools want their students to be able to play a musical instrument if they'd like, or fix a car, or understand algebra, or other opportunities. The board makes sure that the school district has the money, staff, and materials in the right places at the right time to ensure success. The board and superintendent team help students complete their journey in their local schools and prepare them for the future. After talking to Grandpa Freddy, I had a much better understanding of what school boards do. They build a bridge so that the community and the schools can communicate, and they set destinations for the schools so that I can reach my goals. The school board looks out for me, just like my grandpa and grandma do. One of the things that I really like about that video, which I think is about to start again, so I'll move on, yeah, um, is the analogy with the grandparents because I I watched my, my parents become grandparents when my sister had children and they hovered. I mean, they, they my mother was at their house every day. She co-parented really. Um, and I lived 300 miles away. So when I had my children, I was really the parent. And that notion of being able to infringe on, on the parents' um, domain, if you will, sort of reminds me of the temptation to micromanage when you're sitting on a school board. <laughs> um, and if any of you have local parents, you might know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> anyway, the... The role of a, a district school board, as understood both through statute and practice, is that the board has oversight of public education on behalf of the community, your trustees of the community. And, and what are you overseeing? High quality education for every student, good return on investment for the public, meaning that they feel like they're taxes are justifiable, and that your system is operating efficiently, effectively, and ethically. Now, it doesn't mean that you're actually providing the education as a board, nor are you spending the money, nor are you watching the efficient, I mean, uh, managing the efficiency of the way the system is run. 
but you are monitoring all of those things. So one way to think of it is that the, the board is sort of first and last. You're first when it comes to establishing a vision, the, uh, creating and adopting the policies, delineating parameters and understanding what's what are priorities in your education system for your community? And then last, af after you've delegated responsibility to make that happen to your administration, you're, you step in again to monitor and make sure that the money that you're spending is in fact influencing the outcomes that you are looking to influence. Um, so it's, really important that you have that understanding of how, you know, this is the 20,000 foot view, right? Um, so I mentioned that VSBA School Boards Association has developed a platform called the Essential Work of Vermont School Boards. There are six, what we call domains within that, and I am gonna fly through this tonight, but they are, it, um, engaging your community to make sure that the vision that you're establishing for your education is in fact aligned with what the community wants. Um, you have a mission statement, at least I believe this is a mission statement that I got from your website. And that's pretty clear. Caring, creative, equitable learning communities that empower all children, all children to build on their talents and passions and to grow into engaged citizens and lifelong learners. So that's, I mean, it's, it's visionary, it's um, pretty high level, but that's your goal. Now, ultimately, everything else that the board does has to be measured against this goal. So we, I mentioned policy being one of the critical elements of school board work. Policies um, articulate the values and, and concerns that, that parents and community have shared with you that you've sought out to understand. And you're then gonna follow that up um, both with monitoring the educational results, making sure you're legally compliant and making sure that the community understands and, and is aligned with the expectations that you understand them to have. Um, and then you delegate. You delegate to your administration who interprets the policy, right? And, and when I say administration, I mean Libby and her team, but the board is really gonna be directed to Libby and Libby then manages her team. So the board has one entree into the operations. Um, and, and it's up to administration then to interpret those policies in the form of written procedures that talk about how things are gonna get done. The, the board sets the why and then delegates the how, and then comes back at the end and monitors to make sure that the policies, A, are being adhered to and B are still consistent with the values of the community. And so I know you have a policy review schedule and, and that's exactly what the purpose of that is. And of course there are some um, policies that the state will require you to add periodically. Um, there will be others that we as the state association will recommend but aren't necessarily required. The third of these pillars is about the superintendent and the relationship the board and the superintendent have with one another. And as I said earlier, it's a critical relationship and it's really important that everybody understands whose job is what and who does what and how those uh, responsibilities and activities blend. And you have a policy, your policy A02, clearly defines that relationship and establishes what the responsibilities of each of those um, positions is. And I, I, if you haven't read that in a while, it's, it's a long policy, but I really encourage you to go back and look at that because it really spells out a lot about how your board is going to function. Uh, and just to reiterate what I was saying, the board sets the vision, the policies, and is responsible for allocating the resources, right? You prepare the budget, make sure, or try to make sure it gets approved. And then 
there's accountability um, to the to the voting public, to your taxpayers. Your contact and all of that runs through the superintendent who by state statute is actually defined as the chief executive officer of the school district and is the systems leader for the rest of the administrative team, including the principals who are education leaders at the school level, at the building level. The principals report to the superintendent and in some areas, this is a big mess right now. Not so with you guys, so I'm not gonna dwell on that. Um, we talked about a budget. So your budget has to accomplish a bunch of different things, right? It, ha it has to be reflective of the culture and, and the respectful of the financial resources of your district. You need to make sure that you have policies that discuss uh, how your budgets are going to be spent and who has responsibility and who has authority for uh, approving those expenses. The, you work with your management team, with your administrative team to finalize a budget. I think you've just been through this, right? Um, and then it's the board's job to work with the uh, electorate to, to try and get them to understand why the board is recommending this budget and why these funds are necessary. Uh, but and then you also have to be accountable that you've got adequate internal controls happening at the district level that the money is being managed well. And then uh, I mentioned before monitoring. So you need to make sure you see your financials regularly and, and you know how to read them and how to interpret them and how to ask questions about them. And finally, you're obligated again by statute to have an annual financial audit. And in, in doing that, uh, you have some responsibility to understand what that document says and make sure that everything is working appropriately and that your audit reflects good money management. Um, and finally, the, the, the last of our domains is effective and ethical operations. And what I wanna really remind you about here is that school boards don't operate the schools. The administration operates the schools, but you do have your board's operations and there have to be some accepted practices and understanding as to what that all includes. Um, in, in, here again, you have a policy that, that does a really good job of spelling this out. Um, the board members are obligated as elected officers. You are, it's the only power that you have is as a single entity. So a single board member does not have any authority um, as a, an official. You, but as a board, you are a public body that has been elected and speaks for your community. Board members within the board need to recognize and acknowledge the validity of board decisions that are made by vote of a majority, um, even if you're on the losing side. So even if what you believe in didn't pass, you still have an obligation to support the work of your board. Um, and to another one that's often compromised is that you have to maintain confidentiality when you go into executive session, which is why the SBA recommends not even taking minutes in an executive session There's, so that there is no public record that anybody could ask to see at a later date. Um, and finally, the conflict of interest question, which I mentioned earlier is in statute, you need to not only make sure you're avoiding actual conflict of interest, but even perceived conflicts of interest. And, and that gets a little touchy, especially when we live in towns where everybody knows everybody <laughs> or is related to everybody, as is the case in some Vermont towns. Uh, so putting that all together, VSBA has a recommended code of ethics um, that 
we recommend board members sign at the beginning of each term. Some even do it every year. Um, and I'm happy to share this full document with you. This is just an excerpt, but it basically assures that you understand that you are part of a board and not an individual who has any kind of authority that you're not giving directives to the school personnel because you don't have the authority to do that and avoid making any commitments that compromise the decision-making ability of the board. So don't be making any promises outside of the board and then the board's gonna come and vote and, and you've already promised something, some outcome that hasn't yet been determined. Finally, uh, board protocols we recommend that you establish your board protocols at your annual reorganization meeting. Uh, and, and they're pretty important. It's how your meetings run. Um, and again, you have a policy on this, you, policy A03, your expectations for the Montpelier Roxbury board members, I think is a, a really well um, articulated again, lengthy policy that stipulates what the expectations are. And that's public record. So anybody who joins the board has, we presume, has reviewed that document, has agreed to comply with that document because that's a standing policy that has been approved and adopted and is in practice. So that's it for the, the talky part. How are we doing? Are there specific questions here? We are at 7.04, and if you want to open it up for questions, I think there's definitely a lot that um, folks have. Okay, I'm happy to do that, or do you want to take a look at this case study and just sort of structure our conversation around that? I'm, I'm, I'm game either way. Um, How long does a case study take? It's, um, that's the whole, that's what you need to read and then we're gonna talk about it. Let's, let's do the case study if you think it's been helpful. Okay. Can I mean, you- We're at seven, so we're, we're just a little past seven, so we're okay. um, flying why through pretty- Why don't we take five minutes for everybody to read that? And I just wanna know if you can, in fact, read it in this format, because if not, I can pull the document up and share it outside of the PowerPoint. And it looks like Amanda has her hand up. Do you want to say something before we do the study? I'll wait until after the study.
folks still reading? Has everybody finished? Yes, I think so. Okay, great. So what's going on here? Who, who, what do you see? What's the, uh, the question at the bottom? What's wrong with this picture? Uh, I can see the participant list if folks want to raise their hand. Um, Otherwise, I think just speak out because we've got a limited viewing. Anybody? Well, can I ask? I don't know if you folks can hear me. I'm trying to yep. get the audio go. set up. Okay. What what a board vote to censor someone means? If a board votes to censor a board member, what is that? Sue, do you want to give the technical answer to that? I'm happy sure. to give the layperson's answer, but yeah. So, um, if a board votes to censure someone, um, normally what they, well, one of the things that, that you see in this example here is that, um, they come out of executive session and they don't do anything. So I'm not really, um, sure this board actually, um, did do that, but, um, it's a sort of a public, um, acknowledgement by the board that they um, that the person that is being censured has not complied with the board's um, you know uh, protocols or um, code of ethics that type of thing thank you I mean part of the problem is they censured without having to, a discussion and aligning on what the actual issue was and getting agreement on behaviors. Right, they didn't launch into a discussion of, of what the infraction in fact was, right? Um, good point. And yet somehow it feels wrong, right? <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it, it's right or wrong, but shouldn't when, as a as a as a board member, when you're when you're making comments in public, um, I guess this is not a public; it's a closed group, but it's still um, with uh, some members of public. Um, wouldn't it be prudent to to kind of uh, say that this is my personal opinion and not not speaking as a board member or um, you know, clearly stating where the person is coming from, you know, or when they're talking. Yeah, it, it's a very, very tricky um, line, right? And it's sometimes even hard to know when you're crossing the line. But as a board member, you are always a board member for the the period of your term. So you can say, this is my personal opinion and I'm not speaking for the board, um, but you're still a board member. And so if you're in a position, and in this case is maybe extreme, where you have the opportunity to chime in, and in this case, bad mouth the district that you are representing, um, then you really are infringing on, on the board's ability to do its work effectively. And, and your credibility is questioned. Why would you be on the board of a, of a district you don't believe in? And I get that, uh, but just playing as a devil's advocate, um, you could have differing opinions, right? When, you, when you're um, in a board where 
you know, you might not agree with something, so you might vote against a, a, a measure that came across. And, um, you know, you go out and somebody asks a question, um, why would, why, I mean, I'm not talking about this situation, but mm -hmm. in general, why, why did you, you know, why did the, why did you guys make this decision? Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's within your rights to say that um, this is the this is the decision that we all made as a board, and this is the decision that we are proceeding. However, um, you know I had a differing opinion at that point. Right, and I have as a board member, I accept the board's action. Yes. I mean, that's a really critical piece, right? Yes. I, I'm on this board. I may have differed in my vote, and, and it's okay to acknowledge that. Your meetings are open, right? Um, and particularly, as long as we're virtual, you're actually on the record. Um, but the idea that you dissented and therefore you're going to badmouth the action that the board took is really in violation of your policy. So that, that's the key, right? You're bad mouthing it. You're not saying that, you know, I, I disagree with that. Um, I personally disagree with that, uh, uh, whatever the measure was. However, that is the decision that we as a board collectively made, and we are proceeding in that direction. Exactly. So I know I understand this is a, an extreme situation where somebody's bad mouthing it and, you know, they don't like what they're doing and whatnot. Uh, but in general, I, it's a tricky line, as you mentioned, but it is within the rights of a board member to to express uh, uh, his or her views uh, as long as they state that that is the, the the decision that was made was a collectively made decision and um, we are proceeding in that direction right and in this example I mean, yeah. it, I, well I, I'm not sure who's speaking. Sorry, I should raise my hand. But, uh, and I, Amanda, Amanda, I do see your hand up. Let me just address this one comment. In this particular situation, this is not even about a board decision, right? This is not right. even about board level work. This is an operational thing that this board member knows about only because of her other life. <laughs> you know, or other aspects of her life that are not related to being on this board. And so when you start, um, basically, when you start badmouthing at the operational level, you're really um, dismissing the credibility of your administration also, right? Um, there, are pro I, I, there are processes in place when, when there are non-performing teachers but it's not a board member's place to get involved in that at all, right? And so in this case, it's, it's crossing a couple of different lines. Okay, I'm sorry, Amanda, please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, um, it's important to like how you're defining bad mounting, you know, especially because, you know, thinking about tone policing and like how sometimes women are interpreted, you know, like in this, and I'm not talking about this case. Um, I think that there, there has to be a conversation around the, the rights of, a uh, speech rights of board members. And I, I think Anita was saying at something I was thinking about around, um, we do have like dissent, you know, like Supreme Court, you know, I'm thinking this set, like you write your five page when you disagree on something. Yes, that is the board. It doesn't necessarily mean that we all are going to agree on some things that I'm going to be able to vote no and that I'm going to say why I'm not supporting something. That doesn't mean that I am um, against the board, but that, that is the procedure. And so the, the, the same thing around the social media or around, you know, being in blogs or being in... Uh, as someone who wears a lot of hats in the state, uh, totally moving from place to place. And, and you know, I, I, I was uh, researching around speech. Uh, uh, there, there's a, a great document that I found around about my rights as school board members in the First Amendment that has a lot of the 
the laws um, and examples of how they were repealed when they went to the Supreme, the, the, Supreme, the court system. Uh, it's a little old, but so many things might have changed since then. But you know, I think it's important that when we're having these conversations, we're talking about some policing, what is that mountain means? Um, what does it mean when, uh, like, the difference on free speech? Like, what, what are you implying, basically, is, is my question around this. I think it's a really good rule of thumb to understand that while you are on your school board, you really, you can wear other hats and we all do, but you can never take off your school board hat. Or any other hat. <laughs> well, that, that's going to be your, um, you know, each individual's way to interpret it. But as far as the commitment that you have made to this board, to this school district, and to the other board members um, through your policies, and I, I refer you back to those two that I cited earlier, um, A02 and A03. One is about the expectations of board members, and the other is about the relationship between the board and board members and the superintendent. Those are those don't apply only during board meetings. Okay, they're for all the time, 24 seven, as long as you are on this board. And, and so while yes, you can explain that you didn't vote for this particular decision and here are the reasons why, you also um, are, are really in a position to follow it up and say, however, it was the will of the board or the decision of the board, and therefore I accept it. Because you're obligated to do that. What to if, what, so that I'm just trying to understand, right, because I think it's about interpretation. And so if, if the board in its majority is a racist board, am I supposed to then, and I'm not, this is not an example, but I'm using examples as to understand the concept. Mm -hmm. So if I had joined the board, now I love this board. I love this district. I am committed. I am, you know, I know my place. I know I've read those two policies very, very truly uh, before I joined the board and after I joined the board. Um, so I'm trying, so when I join a board that's racist, what is the role of that person? Just to say, okay, it's fine. The board is made, has made racist policies and therefore is the will of the board, even though there's impacted people. I'm trying to understand all of this because I think it's important in terms of when we are inter interpreting and when we are, you know, like thinking either legally or policies that are created just out of like the will of, of um, of white folks when it comes to in impact. And so th this is my lens always, it would always be. So this is how I'm bringing this in. And these questions that I have are based on the, in that, so. So uh, Sue, I invite you to jump in here as well, but it would seem to me that you use the example, Amanda, of the policies, okay? So if that's some an area where you really see um, something that is systemically um, problematic, you could request of your chair that you be on the policy committee. And then you're part of the body that, that reviews those policies on a schedule as already determined. Um, and and if, if, if you can um, get the rest of that committee to agree to a, apply a equity lens tool to each of those policies as you're reviewing them, great. That, that would be the way to work through the system to make the change rather than to um, butt heads and, and dismiss the, the reality of what is. Jim? I mean, I, I just want to say, I mean, I, I think you can, you know, say whatever you want to say under the, the First Amendment. I think the, the important part for me 
is that I think it's very hard to remove your board member hat. So if you want to um, criticize, perhaps very legitimately, either policies or other aspects um, that you know you find fault with, either you know at an operational level or uh, a policy level, um, I think you know be prepared to have a reaction. Be as as a board member, I, I think the argument that I was saying that in a personal capacity, or especially with social media, because social media gets so leaky, um, that was a closed group or a private chat, or um, you know, I was just talking as a parent, I was just talking as a community member. Like those distinctions become very hard because I think you know the example that in the bottom where the press picked up on that, it's. You know, even if you were complaining in this, you know, this example about that teacher kind of as a parent, you're still a board member saying that that teacher has has issues, and um, you know, that's how the public can interpret it. So, that to me is a takeaway from this example. Mm -hmm. Mia, thanks, Susan. Um, I raised my hand for a different reason, so I'll get to that in a second. I think one of the things that's coming up for me though in this part of the conversation is that you know we as a board are working hard on um, learning different um, facets of white supremacy culture so that we can unpack them from the way that we operate and one of those is binary thinking and the um, antidote to that is non-binary thinking and and that has that's one that's been really useful for me in um, in, in life in general, ever since being introduced to it, this, this possibility of being able to hold two truths at the same time, of being a board member who is committed to advancing the values of our community and at the same time hold a critique of, you know, how the board is doing at holding the values of our community. I think that's possible for us to do at the same time, and it's actually quite necessary to do in order to be able to move forward. Um, so that was, I, I wanted to just offer that as, I think a, a component of working through situations like this when, you, you know, as this example plays out. And and then the reason that I that I raised my hand was kind of related to, to that point, but it had more to do with the actions of the board once they learned about what Tina did. Um, one of the things uh, that Emma and I, in the work that we've been doing on the school safety and police relations committee that we've been working with members of the community and staff and other administrators and students is examining the, um, the practices of conflict resolution and, um, and how and actually realizing that our schools are working very hard to become um, more active in using these practices. And um, that actually feels like a place where this board could use a whole lot of help, the board in this example, <laughs> that they went immediately toward a punitive me measure rather than one where that allowed Tina to recognize the impact that her um, action had and learn how to approach a critique that she has of something happening in the district differently next time. Because at the end of the, this example, I don't see anybody having actually reached a resolution that feels very good for, <laughs> for anyone and certainly doesn't make me believe that Tina's gonna do anything differently in her behavior next time. And that also seems like a big problem. Mm -hmm. Good point. Well, um, Susan, I thought that, um, it was it Mia, is that your name? Yes. yes. Uh, you raised a lot of great points. Um, one of the things that, um, on your first point, um, I wondered about whether um, your board had thought about um, using, developing some norms um, I was on a school board for many years and um, we actually went through a, um, a merger. And when we um, had our new board formed, that's the first thing that we did. And it was 
really helpful for us to spend, we spent quite a bit of time developing them. And then we would actually read them at the beginning of each meeting. And at the end of each meeting, we would have a um, good discussion of whether, how we did um, with um, meeting our norms. And it really um, helped keep us um, operating, I think, the way that we said that we wanted to operate. So that might be something to think about. Um, and the other thing, um, I was glad that you recognized the, um, that that seemed, that seemed punitive um, in this example. Um, we actually have a, in our essential work of um, Vermont school boards, we have a sample um, process for addressing board member um, conduct. And um, it, it does not um, go the way this <laughs> example went. Um, it has a lot more steps to it. And it has, you know, the, um, the, the first thing that would happen would be that um, the board chair would, would talk to that person um, so that it, it wouldn't be, um, you know, a, a surprise um, that they're having an executive session about this person because they wouldn't even need to have one, uh, you know, probably the first time unless it was something really egregious. Um, but um, we, I can, if, if any of you would like that um, and you don't have the book, I can just send you a PDF. It's a two page, um, two pages out of the book that um, the first page basically has um, information about um, the board um, discussing and agreeing about how it's going to operate um, and and board member conduct. And then the second page is the sample process. Uh, uh, thank you, Sue. I, I'm going to jump in because um, it is 729. And I don't want to be the one who's keeping you late tonight. Um, but uh, uh, Jim, this feels incomplete to me. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to extend to you all, uh, we're happy to come back to continue this conversation at any time. Um, and, and maybe it's because you're such a, it, there, you have so much new newness on this board, maybe you want us to come back quarterly or something along those lines so that as people are growing into their roles and hiccups surface, we can address them in real time as we go. Uh, you know, we certainly are open to whatever works for all of you. That's, you know, that's what we're here for. Um, and I know we didn't really get to the broader questions away from this case study, but I think some of what we were talking about it, it applies um, outside of these specifics. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And I think uh, it would be great if if uh, you wanted to come back. I know there's a lot, um, you know, uh, yeah, we did only scratch the surface. There's a lot of other stuff here and a lot of great, great points raised. I think as we kind of, you know, think about, um, you know, how we want to operate as a board, we, you know, we do have board expectations in our policies. Um, you know, they do not look like, uh, I think how this example plays out, although I think there are some great things in this example, but certainly in terms of, you know, the, the process, um, uh, but um, yes, we would love to have you you come back and, and we can, can work to coordinate that. Great. Um, uh, uh, just to not leave this as a loose end, uh, in this example, there are also several violations of open meeting law. I'm not going to get into them. I just want to be on record of saying that because I don't yeah. want you to think I'm advocating for things like taking a vote in well, executive session. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so. Maybe, can I say something? Maybe next time we can use the real example that happened in our school board and then we can break it down and figure out a way out of it. Because it, actually there was a, a example that happened at the beginning of this year. Um, and so like, it would be great to like have it out and open and dissect it together and see like, okay, how do we move out of this? And so, and it will be great to have you here and um, talk, you know, break down some of the speech, uh, uh, first amendment rights and like figure out a way, because it's not just about being a school board member, it's about like our individual rights as well. So like, it will be great to have that open conversation amongst our whole board. 
we'd be happy to do that. Um, I think it might, if, if we were going to do something like that, it might be helpful to just schedule a special session um, rather than having it as part of a regular board meeting so that there'd be enough time. It sort of reminds me of what Mia was talking about in terms of our school safety and police relations committee work. We've talked to, we've been looking at our, our board policies and one of the board policies that we're interested in potentially making a recommendation about are the board expectations and that perhaps we include some norms around using restorative justice practices when something happens, a conflict arises within the board so that we can have a method to sort of work through those before we would get to the point where we would be like censuring and things like that. Yeah, and I don't think the, end of the board, to my knowledge, has never censured, and I don't even think our expectations would, would censure in an instance like this. Um, yeah, and we did have, um, I mean, we had an incident, I, I know the incident Amanda is referring to, but I think we had a more severe incident a few years ago um, that ended up on WCAX News. Um, and uh, yeah, I, it, it was actually more apt to this example where someone thought they were talking to a closed group and it was not a closed group. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, uh, yeah it, it targeted a couple board members and it, it went you know, viral and, and ended up on the news. So, um, but you know, censure was not, was not considered and nor was anything in executive session. Um, censure is pretty extreme. Yeah. And I, and I don't think, I don't think as a board, we have any desire to, yeah, I, I don't think, I don't think we have any right or desire to censor people's speech either. So, um, right. but uh, yeah, when, when, when something like this does play out, it, I think it's better to, you know, yeah, you know, to speak about it, and, and the, the board member that was targeted in that instance, um, yeah, you know, addressed it quite, quite gracefully, given the the public um, nature that it all took. So, yeah, and I just, yeah, you know, I, what I would have loved to get into too is just the lines on social media and. Um, yeah, you know, some of the open media laws that occur on social media, use of Facebook, because um, I think we're all on several groups, and um, you know, there's there's considerations about uh, you know how to answer questions and when when there's pile on, et cetera. So I think a, a lot to delve into, and we're happy to to talk about the incident that Amanda is referring to as well. Um, so which we can do in a special session or otherwise. Well, just let it, you know, give us, throw out some dates yeah. and, and we'll we'll make it work. And in the meantime, yeah. we just want to thank you. Yeah, thanks. For, for all that you do. Um, and to the rest of the board, since you are also new, VSBA is your resource. We are here for you. If you have questions, if you have concerns, please pick up the phone, give us a call, send us an email. Um, we are working remotely right now, so we're all at different phone numbers. I've got, um, oh, Sue, I didn't put your number up here. My bad. Um, but you got my number here, and uh, it, you, you can reach us by email. Libby knows how to get hold of us. Jim knows how to get hold of us. Um, and and it will come back whenever, whenever we're invited. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Um, so now I think we've got the facilities presentation and Andrew. How you doing? Wow. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Jill. So, uh, Quick Andrew, question. hold on one second. Does everybody know you? We have new board members. 
I'm not That's sure true. if Andrew, everybody knows me. So Andrew the Rosa is our director of, of buildings and grounds. Um, he is fantastic. And all of the safety and wonderful things that have happened during COVID was because of Andrew's very forward thinking. And he was at the front of the line in every type of ventilation work and every single thing. So Andrew has done, I can't, I can't get away with having him at the board meeting without embarrassing him a little bit. Andrew has done an absolutely amazing job this year um, and is a very valuable part of our team and has been working really hard on this facilities report for you all for, for quite a while now. So, all right, Andrew, I've embarrassed you enough. Now you got to really impress them. Agenda item one, <laughs> raise, raise. Okay, so I think Libby, uh, so how many, so the, the facilities report was included in the board packet, correct? Does, did anybody get a chance to read it? Yes, yeah. it was excellent. Okay. Yeah. So what um so you guys, one of the things that I should be doing for you guys is exactly this facilities report. Um Libby, I'm gonna need the screen if I could. You can share access at some point. Should be yeah. able to share it. Oh, okay. Um so I'm not gonna go over the whole thing. I kind of pulled out some highlights of some things that, that I thought were should be on your radar. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have um, right now off of what you what you read or as we hit a school, if there's something that jogs your memory, just jump right in. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. All right. So, um, so, yeah, so that's one of the benefits you have of having me work for you guys is is that we can we can have this document this living document uh available so um and i think we should be we should uh because this is the first time you've seen it really one of the things that i'm going to want from you guys over the next couple of weeks or months oh this is bad lighting isn't it um is uh your feedback on what different information you'd like, what more information you'd like, what less information you need. So as you read through it and as you think of these things, uh, share them with Libby, share them directly, send me an email. Hey, you know, cover this next time. Um, and we can work that in. The other thing that, uh, the other thing that we have to do at some point is figure out the appropriate time for this document to be shared with the board. Um, now, luckily we've got this done and you can, whenever there's a new board member, we can share this with them. And, um, but a certain, probably in the spring when things lighten up a little bit, would probably be a good time to review this. Maybe we can even, I'm more than happy to schedule building tours, um, take people through the buildings. Um, and also this will help you guys sort of, as you start to think about budgets, um, you know, what are some of the priorities that, that we make sure we're focusing on. So the the purpose of this report again isn't to give you guys very specific information about every plumbing fixture that needs to be uh changed out or um you know which classroom needs a new lock on the door whatever it's to give you just an overall picture of when someone asks you how many classrooms there are at, at roxbury you have a sense of that when they ask you whether a building is sprinkled or not you can answer that question um what we haven't done, what the action items that I put in there, the sort of recommendations, those are, those are sort of also general in that no single project ever is a standalone. There's always some ramifications. If we change a heating system in a room or in a building, once you start tearing into walls, are you going to replace the ceilings? While you're replacing the ceilings, well, we might as well do the lights. If we're doing the lights, do we need to do the upgrades to the path to the panel? So. The, the, the recommendations, again, are very general, um, and they're not particularly in-depth. They're all just sort of visual observations. You, you don't really know what's going to happen until you start opening up things, which is one of the reasons that we don't get into costs. Now, we started to think about that, and the thing with the costs are is it's very easy. If you wanted me to give you a number on how much it would cost to renovate the building, I could probably give you a pretty accurate cost on that. If you ask me how much it is to renovate a wing, and if you ask me to, about a classroom, I'd be really wrong because you just don't know 
you don't have any slop. When you estimate a lot of things, some things are going to be high, some are going to be low, and they cut, they have a tendency to balance themselves out. So that's why we kind of stayed away from cost. Again, once you see this, once you get more engaged with the actual buildings and you want to know specific costs, then I'll have a, I'll be, it'll be easier for me to pull those numbers out, talk to the professionals I need to to, to pull that together. The other thing we didn't didn't really get into with this report is the space needs. You know how, you know where do we need more space in what building? Um, we started to have those conversations. COVID sort of put that on the back burner. Uh, some of you were involved with the uh, Main Street Middle School conversations, and the space needs, I think, really travel as bubbles, where we have a class that's that's large, um, and we we seem to have enough space as it stands now to sort of accommodate those. Um, I think that we're probably relatively close if we get a lot of new students in the buildings. Yeah, we may have to actually move some spaces around and, and take a, a much closer look. Um, but again, I think that space needs first has to, that has to happen with the principals and the superintendent to think about, you know, how are we teaching? What kind of, what kind of spaces do we need to teach? Not today, but tomorrow and 10, 15 years down the line. Energy, you know, for the longest of times, and um, we have made a conscious yet unscientific effort to um, to run our buildings as ener energy efficient as possible. Uh, whenever we make upgrades, we use LED fixtures. We make sure that our mechanical systems are working at the highest efficiency they can. We um, make sure our control systems work as as well as they can. Um, you know, a controls package is only as sophisticated as the user. And you can have the most space age sophisticated controls package to run high efficiency, but if people don't know how to run it, the, system, the building will run inefficiently. We've actually have done a very good job about staying on top of that. Uh, we, we have a we work with Honeywell very closely. We've got a service contract with them for $25,000 where they come in and, and we have a great relationship where we pick up the phone and, and we call Scott and he comes down and helps us out. So we are, we are engaged in conversations with the city and their net zero. Uh, so we are becoming more sophisticated with our energy users. We did have our buildings retro commissioned last year, last, last uh, winter, which actually put us in great position when it came to the COVID indoor air quality work, because we actually had engineers who had been through our buildings and had actually written up reports on our mechanical systems and, and their thoughts on on uh, what we could do and what we should do with our systems. So we, we're we we're in very good position there. Are there places to save energy? Absolutely. And one of the things that we have is we're, we use a lot of energy, so which means we can, when we make changes and we make efforts to conserve it, we can actually make uh, great headway in that area. Um, you know, the condition of the buildings, I think, you know, we've got old buildings, 1917, 1930, whatever for the union, the 50s for the high school and 18, whatever, down at union up to 1984 uh, or down at Roxbury. Um, they're in good condition. Uh, union and Main Street were built with very durable materials. Um, same thing with the high school. High school was a well-made building back in the 50s. And, and Roxbury actually has, has being a wood construction, uh, has survived very well. What you guys got to keep in mind um, is we got, you know, over a thousand students, you know, 200 plus employees, and Libby, I may be wrong on these numbers, but, you know, and we're open 11 to 14 hours a day. You know, these buildings get a lot of use. And um, so, the um, they're 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 well used buildings, but uh, in general we we've done a good job of staying on top of them and keeping them in good condition. You know, a lot of that has to do with the custodial staff, um, and more spe specifically Tom Allen, who's our maintenance and custodial supervisor. We, you guys, and me as a taxpayer, are so blessed to have Tom Allen in the district. His level of professionalism would be the envy of any school in this state. And I'm not just saying that he absolutely is passionate and smart and hardworking. And he has instilled that on Chris and Glenn down at the other schools and the custodial staff in general. The other sort of 
piece about the custodial staff that's sort of hard to uh, quantify, but is the staff has a great relationship with the kids. And I saw that when my son was down at the union with Todd when he was working there, and I see it with Glenn at Main Street Middle. And that relationship the custodial staff has with the kids, you can see that in the building. I'm going to knock wood here because I can hear the spray paint going. The problems of things like graffiti and vandalism and stuff of that nature just doesn't happen in our school district. And um, we're I think that has a lot to do with that relationship that the kids have with the, the folks who take care of the buildings. Um, so I cannot praise those guys enough. And like I say, the professionalism that Tom's brought through this doesn't mean there's not room for improvement. But even over the last five years or seven years since Tom's been there, before Tom got there, every school was doing their own thing. Like they were buying their own products and deciding what products to use in their building. And he went through and said, no, 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 we're all going to use the same products. We're all going to order from the same people. We're all going to be able to trot cross train so someone can go from one building to the other and pick things up and have a routine and, and, and tackle it. Amazing. Really quite, we're very quite lucky. So again, the next thing is the feedback. You know, what you guys, what more information you need, what more information, uh, what information is just, you just don't need. And again, the walkthroughs, I'm, I work, I work 40 hours a week. Whenever anybody wants to come through, let me know and I'm happy to take you on a tour. Any questions about the overall? So you saw in the report, what we did, what I did was I started big picture started on the outside of the building and, and worked our way in um, when I talk about individual buildings. Some of the things that we do, just to give you a sense, of when, again, when the public asks where your tax dollars go, every year we, we continually work on the buildings. It's the other thing that Tom has brought forward is that we used to have this sort of mentality like everything had to get done in the summer and everything stopped once school started. Well, we don't stop anymore. We keep making improvements throughout the year and um, we make sure that we don't interrupt education, but we you know, we don't wait for the spring or the summer to take care of a project. If it needs to get fixed now, we fix it now. And it sounds, it may sound like, yeah, of course you do that, but that's not necessarily the case in a lot of schools. So in a typical year, we do things as mundane, and these are, these are some of the things that have happened, and these are just things that have happened in the last few years. We go through, you know, we, we've done, have done things as mundane as number the exterior doors and shared it with first responders. Like, now the police department and the fire department know, and if there's ever a phone call that says, hey, you know, there's trouble at door six at the elementary school, we all know what door they're talking about. Very mundane, but I think important. We've got bleed kits and Narcan and EpiPens in the buildings, and all every floor has a, a defibrillator in it now. Um, so things that are very small like that. To every year we renovate uh, probably an average of two to three classrooms in each building every year will go through, change the lights, ceilings, paint, flooring, um, things of that nature. But I'm not gonna go through the whole list here, but you know, so simple things, but important things. All the buildings now have chilled, filtered water bottle fill stations in the corridors. So that, that and that's a, with the um, drinking water, we have gone through and we've done over 200 tests in the district. And you can go on our website and you can see the results uh, for every test that we've done, location, results, what we did, uh, what changes we made, it, what we needed to do, and we've gone through that. There's a couple of gaps with what the state has on record, but we're, we're working through that. Again, mechanical system reviews. Um, uh, what are some of the other things there? So that's union. Um, a lot of this, a lot of the other things that we've been trying to do is um, unify systems so that when we have inspections, when we have a fire alarm inspection, we don't have them at four different times a year, at four different schools. We say, you come on one day and you do all four of our schools. Very, sounds really silly, but it's important. Um, again, union replacing light covers in the, in the, um, hallways, renovating bathrooms. In the, in the Union, we now have all new bathrooms uh, at Union, Main Street, and the high school, and down at Roxbury. Basically, all of our gang bathrooms within our schools are, I don't think there's any that are more than seven years old at this point. 
Uh, there's a couple small one one user bathrooms down at Roxbury, but Roxbury had two bathroom renovations uh, last year. Union again with the bond project, as you guys can remember, we, we did the playground, we have the, the ADA vestibule, a new fire alarm elevator system down there. So we do not only small projects, but we do large ones as well. Um, again, Main Street, we went through that. High school, you know, high school, um, again, we've taken care of a lot of silly things like, I don't know if however many of you went to the baseball field or went behind the, uh, the bleachers, but there used to be this electrical panel out there with wires sticking out and all that. We took care of that. We renovated, we added bleachers in the gym. Part of the bond project, we put in new sound system, seating um, and ceilings at the um, auditorium. We've got new locker rooms at the high school. We've got a new fitness room at the high school. Uh, we've reconstructed the softball field in anticipation that there's gonna be softball coming back to the high school. We're all set for a middle school team this year. One of the big things we did at the high school this summer is last year is we got rid of the mud lot, um, which I, I'm very pleased about that. Having that first impression of being a muddy parking lot was not the first impression that you want. we wanted to present to the students and the, the population. Um, fitness center, restoration. so that's that. Future projects, some of the things we're kind of looking at and you know, projects change. We we get together with the administration in each of the schools in September and say, what do you need next year? Where are teachers moving? What do we got to do? And we write it all down and we make a list and we put it into the budget. And then we know that by December, it's going to change. And by April, it's going to change again. But we are able to shift it. And, you know, it, it we, we know that it's going to get spent and the money's going to be spent. And if it's not Mr. Jones's classroom, we know it'll be Mrs. Smith's room that's going to change. So we don't get too hung up on that quite yet in the sprint in the fall. But a couple of things we're looking at. Roxbury, I think we've got some casework, uh, cabinetry down at uh, Roxbury that needs to be upgraded. Uh, we've got some mechanical systems down there that we're investigating currently, um, changing over to um, some heat pumps, possibly. We've got engineers working on that right now to give us a better understanding of what the potential is. The town hall down there, if, if none of you, uh, some of you haven't been down there, one of the oldest buildings is the town hall, which is used for town meeting. It's used for community events. It's used uh, for a cafeteria. It's used as the gym. It's a very uh, hard to use space. Um, we paint it every year. We improve the lighting, but we need to, we need to put do a little more work down there to make it even sturdier so it, so it stays looking um, looking good even longer. Um, union, some of the things that union we really want to focus on coming uh, is the little gym that that needs to that needs a little work. As part of the capital fund, we have a renovation to the auditorium coming as well as window renovation, restoration, replacement. And I'll talk about that a little bit. We've got to do some cleanup in the basement, storage issues down there. Main Street. Uh, again, windows are a high priority. There's some site improvements that I think need to happen over at um, Main Street, primarily sort of in the back. And I'm not sure I'd call it a playground, but the, the play area out back. Uh, last year, I don't think we put this down. I put this down, but last summer, last summer, uh, we restored, replaced, uh, reconstructed the basketball courts at Main Street Middle. I don't know if any of you remember the old basketball courts that would get filled with water and were all sunk and, and deteriorated. Those have been, um, those were reconstructed last year. So they're nice and smooth and they drain well and we've got a nice painted court and new backboards. Um, another kind of pressing issue down at Main Street is kitchen improvements. Uh, that kitchen is very small. Um, it doesn't have much preparation space. It is really, it was, shoehorned in and it was definitely shoehorned at a time when it was a reheat tater tots type situation, which I don't think uh, that Jim speak to it, but that's not really what we want to do. Um, so that's a tough one. The kitchen is below grade and we're right on a property line. So expansion and um, uh, additions to the Main Street middle is definitely going to be a challenge, but it's definitely 
we need to make it better, even with it, if it's within the same footprint. At the high school, uh, high school is probably the building that's probably in the best overall condition. Uh, but we uh, are improving the access to the river. Um, the, that was part of a Friends of the Winooski project with uh, some teachers and um, someone, if, you, if you've been on the bike path, you see there's a new, new sign at the boat launch. We're gonna be planting um, trees down there. There's some talk of some benches. Um, it is also an area that we need to be mindful of. We, we had a, um, it, was, it was used as a campsite last year um, some of which I didn't even realize until, you know, I really started to look, uh, but we're going to stay on top of that early this year. Um, and hopefully with those site improvements, we also cleared out some of the dead trees that were a little bit dangerous and overhanging and we've cleaned that up there. A DDC control system, basically the controls that we have at the high school that control the mechanical system are the oldest in the district. Tom has to do a lot of sort of tricking the system into, um, making changes that it can't really do itself. Again, we've got an engineer looking at that right now. The other thing that the high school doesn't have with its, its uh, DDC control system is a CO, CO2 CO detector. So to bring in fresh air when we need to do that, that's gonna be part of that. Classroom, there is a three acre stormwater improvement that I talked with Michelle Braun uh, today or emailed back and forth with her on that one. That is still, we've got a design on that. Um, but I, I think we're a couple of years out before anybody's going to make us do anything on that. And I think there's going to be funding available for that. Um, the only other thing, some flooring upgrades, I think in the entrances and the science lab, but that gives you kind of a sense of some of the, beyond the sort of normal, you know, repair as we go. Some of the things that we've got kind of in the front of our, our mind moving forward. So. Any questions so far? So I'm just going to buzz through the schools. And again, some of the things that sort of sort of we think about and deal with and, and maybe you've seen or maybe you should be aware of when someone asks you. So down at Roxbury, it's about 10,000 square foot building. Um, it's got limited sprinkling. It's wood construction. That's right here on 12A. Um, one of the things with Roxbury is it is the flat. It's probably the one flat spot at the very bottom of Roxbury. So all the water comes down. So in the spring, we have a little bit of, of uh, water that we have to deal with. There's no real place to push it as far as I can tell. Um, so it's something we just deal with every year and we try to, we rope off the area where it gets wet and we give it a week or two and it dries out and we're okay there. That's, that's often a problem. Metal roof has been, is, is, um, is a good sturdy material, but it's the absolute wrong material for a school building because the snow comes crashing off onto little kids' heads. Um, every small town in Vermont passes a bond to build a school and puts a metal roof on because that's how you get the people to pay to, to vote for it because they say you're crazy not to put a metal roof. But we manage it. We're very lucky. We have a, a, a local individual who works for the school district. It's actually got kids in the school. Uh, who comes and does our shoveling for us and the snow clearing and he does he does a great job for us. So we've been very fortunate with that. Again, wood building, um, typical 80s construction in the back. It, it's the it's 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 held up well. It's a fine it's a fine building. We are gonna have to do some painting and that's something we deal with every year. Um, exterior painting, but but in nothing we we can't really manage. Basically double loaded core, or it's a, it's a single loaded corridor. I'm gonna go up a little bit here. So this was, and if I'm wrong, Zach, you can, this is the town hall. This was the original kind of two room schoolhouse. And then this portion, which was the kitchen and a classroom was added to connect these. And then in 80, in the eighties, these last three classrooms were, were added back here. Um, this being, so we've basically had classrooms off a corridor here, a classroom here, a couple classrooms here, the town hall. Um, <coughs> typical classrooms are adequately sized. We've been gone, we we and uh, Northfield in the town past has done a pretty good job of going through the classrooms every 10 years or so and, and 
working on the finishes, replacing the finishes. Um, there's definitely a couple of classrooms that are, you know, are going to need to be uh, spruced up here in the coming uh, coming couple of years. But in general, it's a pretty good shape. Here's a picture of the, the town hall. Um, the kitchen, when we took over for Northfield, um, they had ordered a new kitchen hood. So we and a new hood and we, it was the wrong one and it didn't fit and we had to have one reconstructed. So the kitchen is functional. It's very small. It's functional. It needs, and it's got new equipment in it, refrigerators and, and um, stoves and all that, but it does need to be gone through one more time. It, it needs to be, have everything pulled out, new floor put in, new finishes and put that nice equipment back into that room. We just, that was the original plan, but we were, the summer that we took over the building, we realized that the stuff that had been ordered was not the right equipment for the space. And we were, it was a real thrash just to get it up and running for the start of school, but it is. Um, mechanical systems down there are um, baseboard heating, three little boilers, really high efficiency circulator pumps. It's a very simple system. It's almost a, just a big residential system it's got some quirks, but generally it works well. We actually, this, as part of the uh, indoor air quality COVID money, we were actually able to put monitoring on the building. So now Tom can check his phone at five o'clock in the morning to make sure the heat is running other than our first line of uh, warning being Tina when she shows up in the morning. So that's a great help um, that we're not just blind waiting for someone to show up and have, find out the building's cold. So that that's a great piece. Um, as part of the mechanical systems, I mentioned the heat pumps. One of the things that building does suffer from in combination with that little valley down there is very interesting. It gets sometimes warmer than it is here in Montpelier, sometimes colder or sunnier. It's just everything sort of is concentrated down there. And you throw in this, this, this moisture that ends up down here and this 80s construction, which has a polyurethane, a polyurethane, poly, um, plastic, we'll call it plastic, pa plastic in the walls. It was the way we built in the 80s. There's, this building gets awfully humid. Certainly this section of the building gets awfully humid and it gets drier in the summertime. It gets drier the older the construction you get because the building actually breathes. So we have dehumidifiers running down there. That's one of the things the heat pumps may be able to help us with is dehumidifying that building, which would be a really fabulous thing. The school district, Northfield, used to run the heat in that building 365 days a year, the heat was on in that building just to keep it at 72 degrees. Cause you get down there in the summertime and you're wearing a jacket, you know, it's 42 degrees in that building on a, any given July, Tuesday after Tuesday morning, it's 40 degrees down there. So um, that mechanical system, we should be able to um, improve that. Um, you know, life safety stuff, um, we, no bird alarm on the building. Uh, there is a there is absolutely a, a, a fire alarm. There's limited sprinkling. We do have a badge system down there for security. We rekeyed the building when we took it over. Um, so everybody really going into the building, the only way they're getting in is with a badge. Um, as anybody that's been involved with schools knows that everybody in town, used to anyway, everyone in town had a key to the elementary school in their town. And throughout all of our buildings, they, they're all in a badge system now. Tracy Locke does a great job managing who has access, who doesn't have access, when they can have access. And again, let's talk about Tom Allen. Every Monday morning, Tracy prints out a list of who's been in the building so Tom Allen can look and see who was in the building to see what, if there was an issue, who was there, what they were doing, when they were there. Um, that's the kind of thing Tom does for us. And so, um, again, we've got defibrillator down there, EpiPens, uh, bleed, <coughs> stop the bleed kits, all those new. We go through, work with the fire department, make sure all the leads and terminals for those, for the defibrillators are up to date and work really closely with the nursing staff in all the buildings on those sorts of issues to make sure that things aren't out of date. Um, again, lead paint when we've got a preschool program down there. So that's very, every year we have um, emergency 
the management supervisor now is it basically the protocols we have to do for a for a pre-k program is one of them is lead lead paint inspection and we we although i'm certified to do it although i can't it's emp EM, emp um i've got that certification i'm not doing it we hire we've got a gentleman jim Breer, uh, beer who does it for us every year i'm not going to go in and inspect lead paint once a year just that's crazy for me to do it's worth spending a couple hundred dollars with him to have an expert come in and do that. So he does that for us every year, comes in. The school actually, as I understand it, Northfield, um, a few years before we took over the building, actually scraped the bottom five feet of that building, scraped it down to bare wood, and then repainted it. So they didn't have the original lead paint on the building. Um, so, but we have to presume all paint is lead. So we, we, we go through and we uh, prep it, we get it inspected, and they come through. They do that inspection at Union as well, in the pre-K classrooms there as well. Um, green building stuff, again, uh, we have we recently signed a, um, a uh, net metering agreement for solar power for that building. Uh, the farm, the farm, we've started to correct, collect on those credits. We haven't, we're not fully on board with that yet. They're, they're still commissioning some of their solar fields. We've done that for Main Street as well this last fall. So now all of our buildings are partially powered by solar farms. Uh, they're, all, they're all on net meter contract. Um, that would say that's, that's new for, for Roxbury and Main Street middle this year. Andrew, and I had a... I had a question, if it's an okay time to jump in. Um, I, I hail from Roxbury. I'm the newest, I think I'm the newest um, member of the board. And uh, yeah, I just had a question. I'm, and I'm also just fairly new, new to Roxbury, only about three years. Um, yeah, so I was, I was interested about that solar net metering um, agreement that came about. And, and then also the, the Grunfos pump system that you mentioned in the report. And if... So and it sounds like I'm curious, kind of what those what those do is, what those do. It sounds like they're connected to the boiler system, but there's also some talk of upgrading those into um, electric heat pumps. And so, as part of the idea of getting involved in a solar net metering metering agreement, because you anticipate shifting to more of an electrical heat source, and just kind of what you see the future there, or if like the solar net metering is really just like to keep the lights on and and that type of electricity use. Yeah, so the, the, the circulator pumps, the Grunfoss, those are just, so what we have at the high school and we're getting, the, our engineer is getting us a proposal to replace those as well, it used to be just these big inefficient pumps that just pump water all the time, 100%. The Grunfoss pops, pumps are, um, they're just, they're, their impeller design is so much more efficient and they, they, they're able to um, regulate so they don't pump 100% all the time. They can go down to 15% when it's not needed and they can cycle up and cycle down and they do it just, they're just more efficient motors. So that's that's sort of the industry standard for circulator pumps. And that's just something it happens to have. With regards to the net metering, really that was, that came about from, um, uh, we had had it at the high school and the elementary school for five or so years. And it, um, we had an opportunity to, there, there were more, there were a couple of uh, folks who came to us and said, hey, we're having capacity. We're getting capacity availability. Do you have any interest? And so we put it out to bid. Um, unfortunately, only one, well, one, one company uh, was, was able to provide the services and, and we went with them. With regards, it wasn't in anticipation of taking over the, the you know, putting electrical heat pumps. What the engineer is doing right now is he is, they are looking at the building, looking at what our options are from going from um, sort of wall pack kind of residential scale units that we could run one compressor and maybe serve two classrooms and get some heating, get some cooling, you know, could it take handle 60% of our heating load? Probably. Uh, I don't know if he's going to run these numbers versus, okay, if we wanted to go 100% heat pump, what would that look like? You know, and what, so that's exactly what he's doing right now is, is going to put out sort of two or three options of here's what you have to do to tackle, you know, to get 50% of our heating would be a piece of cake, I think. You know, again, that would look very residential. To do 90% or 95, 
that gets a lot more complicated. The good thing is we do have a mechanical system that could take up that extra 5%. Um, so that's exactly what he's doing. And I'll have, I'll have better information on that um, in, a, in a two, three weeks. I think his report's due on March 1st, but he said he's running a week or so behind. So um, the will, as part of, in the future, the folks from the Montpelier Net Zero Group are going to be coming and, and talking with the, the board. So I'll have a, I'll be in a better position to kind of give a sense of what it would take to, to put that building all the way on um, on heat pumps. Heat okay. pumps really work. They're got they've gotten a lot better, but they only they only work to a certain temperature, and uh, we go well below that temperature on quite a few nights down there. But again, we've got the infrastructure to turn the boilers on. So, okay. more to come thank, on that one. Thank you. And I just want to be a little mindful of time because we're almost. Yeah. Just, um, uh, so, just in terms of a path forward, do you want to maybe hit a couple more highlights, take a couple questions, sure. and I think it might be great to um, arrange, especially as we all start to get vaccinated here, uh, maybe some building tours so people can go in and actually, you know, see some of the stuff on the ground and, uh, yep. you know, have have you or Tom explain it? Yeah, and absolutely, because that's one of the things that Tom and I, and I work very closely with Tom, and he's a great, absolutely fabulous sounding board, I think, um, for, for, for each other. You know, we, everybody looks at something differently. You know, when, when a principal looks at a drinking fountain, old repair, he didn't see that. He's got, he or she has bigger issues to, to deal with. And I may focus on and go, oh, that looks terrible. And you know, so, so having that sort of perspective of what are the important things is, is um, you know, what we do a lot with the principals is we bring things up and, and get their feedback on what they want us to focus on. So Union and Main Street, I think the biggest issues here that we have, uh, or biggest challenge we have are the windows. Um, I know that, that that's always been put out there as part of the fund balance issue. And it's sort of been this thing that's, uh, I think it's been so big to tackle that it's kind of gotten kicked down the road a little bit. Well, we're not gonna kick it down the road anymore. Um, I have been working with um, Heritage Environmental out of Burlington. They do window restoration and, and historic building restoration. They do all the work up at UVM. They're a great outfit. I've worked with them in the past. Um, we're gonna take uh, a classroom at, at, U at Union Elementary and we're gonna have them restore the windows, restore and improve the windows. They're gonna take them out. They're gonna do all the, the, the paint abatement. Uh, we're gonna presume, we have to presume that there's lead in that, in that paint. Um, we're gonna tab those windows. They're gonna take them, they're gonna dip them. They're gonna strip them. They're gonna reglaze them as needed. Paint, new weather stripping, new bulb stripping, new latches, insulate the watt, the, 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 the weight pockets, replace the cords, really make them as uh, make them as efficient as possible and as functional as possible. On the other side, we're gonna take, we're gonna replace a window with a brand new uh, metal clad, aluminum clad, historic, you know, the, the same historically appropriate new window. And in another window, we're going to do what was, uh, I think we're going to do what was pro proposed 10 or so years ago, the idea of leaving the jams in place, but putting in new sashes, putting in new windows and all that. The reason we're doing that is, so we had a proposal to do, just to give you a sense of this, um, we had a proposal to do eight windows of restoring them. And it was close to $30,000 to do eight windows. We've got close to 300 windows between the two buildings. Um, new windows are running around $5,000 a piece. And you throw another thousand or so of that for installation. So the idea of replacing all these windows and these numbers, again, this has been a problem that's been talked about for many years. So I'm looking at quotes from 10 years ago and quotes from five years and quotes from a year ago. And anybody that's involved in construction right now knows that material costs are going crazy. Um, event material, some contractors I've been talking to was last summer wasn't so bad, but people are like kind of run out of stock now. And so 
I think the quote that I got last year for Windows, you know, obviously it's probably 10% off now. Um, but so we're going to, we're working with EF wall um, as our contractor to help us do that. So we're going to have a real world. What does a restored window look like? How does it function? We're going to have a new window that we actually do the beta test of pulling it out. And what kind of work do we have to do to the interior of the building? Um, you know, all that kind of work. So then we can, an appropriate group can go through and, you know, decide, oh, hey, these restored windows, I can actually open them. I can close them. They don't, they aren't leaky. They, they look good. They, and we can get a, we can get EF wall to help us with a cost estimate and we can get a true accurate number of how much it's going to cost, how long it takes to install a window, because that's the other thing with this project is there's only, we're really only going to be able to do it, you know, for eight weeks a summer. And uh, we're not going to be able to go and do all the buildings. This is going to be many, many summers worth of work. So um, that's what we're going to do this summer to sort of get our head around it. And, and again, it's, it's going to be many summers. It's going to be um, many, many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars. Dare I sell you probably over a million dollars when it's all said and done. Um, and potentially even significantly more than that. But uh, we need to start doing it because we've been kicking the can on it for too long. So that's, that is really the big, you know, there's some other little things that you need. We're taking care of. We've got some of this, like this stuff, we've got historic Mason coming in. And as we've, again, we, Tom and I were talking about it, you know, we pay for these sins for, from things that happened 20 years ago. If somebody had just done it right the first time, we wouldn't have been looking at this for 20 years and um, now having to deal with it. So like, we're gonna get rid of this stuff where the old drinking fountains were taken off and new ones installed and things that were taking care of that. You, the, the kids deserve better than that. Um, and it's, we're gonna be doing that at uh, Union. Uh, we've got one at the high school. So here's a typical classroom that was renovated at Union. New carpet, new lighting, new ceiling. Um, and that's, that's kind of the, the COVID setup that we have. The kids come in, they're six feet apart. They have a bin for their stuff at the end of the day. It's all there for the custodians to wipe down. Um, the auditorium, again, that was part of the capital fund that when it's done is going to be fabulous. It is going to be the most beautiful room in Montpelier. Um, luckily a few years back, Tom Wood actually had some plaster repair done, um, the seats are old and wood, but we'd never be able to afford to buy anything that would last 80 years like these have. Um, so that's a space that I really can't wait to get going on because that's going to be that's going to be fabulous when it's done. Andrew, just looking at time, I'm wondering if the board members have any questions for your expertise in the room around the building. Jim, that right there is any easy. questions for uh, really, the, got Amanda? Oh, I just want to say thank you, Andrew, for the report and for all your work and for your commitment to the district. Just that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, other Andrew, Stein. <laughs> yeah, I second that, Andrew. Um, I feel like I regularly he prays on you and and I really am very appreciative and I, I I think the entire board is very appreciative of of the work that you do and um the professionalism and expertise that you bring to the job. Can you provide us just with like a, a brief explanation of um well let me just preface this with the board is we received a presentation recently from students um about reducing greenhouse gas emissions in at next meeting we're going to be hearing uh, from Kate on the Energy Committee about the citywide effort, and you might be there as well to chime in. Um, and we formed a Facilities and Energy Committee. And with what you were just touching upon on COVID, um, it's something that we, we talked about briefly, but can you touch on um, you know, balancing energy efficiency with some of the measures that have been necessary to uh, 
improve air circulation and uh, mitigate the threat of COVID spreading in our schools and how those work with or against each other? Yeah, so you really, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not about, to, to me, in a school setting, it's not necessarily about using less energy, it's about getting the best use out of that energy. Because you can have, if we renovated this school and we put in the most energy efficient system we can, could, we'd probably still use more energy than we do right now because the code is now greater than it was before and we bring in more fresh air than we ever did before. And that's a better learning environment, we should. Um, and so the energy, like I say, the energy use is always going to continue to go up. So you mitigate that by having smart systems, good equipment, a good maintenance and operations plan, and um, and just using that energy as wisely as possible. You know, the, the, with regards to the city and the net zero, you know, I, 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 they're working on something and they're they're working with a consultant now that's really going to, I, I for me personally, going to open my eyes more globally with regards to. You know, when it, someone says to me net zero, I think, oh, you know, you live off the grid. Well, that's not that's not the case. It's it's finding energy in other sources. It's carbon credits. It's um, it's net metering. It's things of that nature. Um, we did we have in the past looked at things like, you know, we've looked at it's a little bit off track, but things like solar panels. Well, our roofs won't hold solar panels. They just weren't designed for that that load. So we can't just throw solar panels on our roof to do that. We have to get it off site. Um, biomass facilities. You know, unfortunately, fortunately, um, our mechanical systems are in pretty good shape. So if you just did a not, if you just did a dollar analysis of it, you, you would never say, you know, it'll pay for itself. There's lots of school districts for many years, a few years back, um, that weren't even running their biomass plants because oil was just so cheap that you just didn't even need to run it because it was cheaper to burn oil than it was to burn wood. So, so a lot of the stuff on site um, may not be a great fit, but again, I think they've got a more global vision of what it uses, what it means to use energy and, and be net zero. So I'll be very interested to learn about that. Um, we did with regards to this year, it'll be interesting our oil usage, but again, we, our doors are open much more often. Our windows are open. Um, we've got fans in the windows and things like that, but we're also shutting our schools down at three o'clock in the afternoon. Whereas in a typical year, the high school is running from six in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. And the other schools until seven, you know, six or seven. Um, so that's gonna be kind of tough to, to judge with regards to, um, with regards to how much more energy we're using this year than we did last year. One of the good things I can tell you though, is that when we got through the retro commissioning, the uh, maintenance operations, we had Honeywell again, Scott Lampson, who works for Honeywell, lives in Waterbury, loves the school district, just really likes the guys, likes the building, likes being involved in schools. And um, he does a lot of work in New Hampshire. So he just likes stopping off and, and helping us. Um, they for three weeks went in every nook and cranny and opened up every piece of mechanical equipment we had and greased every bearing and replaced every belt and ran the computers to open the flaps up and down and it just got everything. And there was an audible whoosh in all of our buildings when we opened them here this summer, which is fabulous because those motors were spinning just as hard going through dirty filters or through, you know, trying to go through a, a, a damper that was closed when it was supposed to be open. So, um, the buildings are as running as efficiently as they ever have is my is my guess and we're gonna and we're committed to continuing that um, i don't know if that answers your question yeah that generally does thanks andrew sorry mm -hmm. uh jared hi um yeah i love the report andrew it was fantastic and my question is um just in terms of community awareness uh, do, you, do most parents know about these updates? Um, and I'm thinking of Roxbury. I mean, it would have been great to share this at town meeting, but of course that didn't happen. I'm just wondering what are some ways where we can 
um, let the community know that of all the great work that's happened to these buildings? Well, I think that, and, and Libby, I'll look to you for your thought. I mean, I think that a report like this should be on the district webpage on the facilities. You know, they're, they're paying, the taxpayers are paying for this, so they ought to know what's going on. Um, so I think that's a great way of doing it. Uh, we had tried, we have tried um, this year to send out some notifications to parents and staff about what the, we were doing with the mechanical systems and cleaning protocols and things of that nature. So I think there's probably, um, we could probably do a, a, we could probably do a better job of you know, maybe feeding the, the, the principals a little bit of, hey, don't forget to mention this little project that we did in your building. The parents might be interested in seeing that, uh, that they could put out in their newsletter, something like that. But um, we, we, we absolutely could communicate this better out to the parents. I'm not one generally who likes to communicate with people, but <laughs> I know that's why. That's why Libby's there to say, no, you should, or, or what to say. Yeah, I was, I was thinking for Roxbury, like a little binder to say what, what has been going on in your school, what, where the parents have to wait or something like that, just so they could kind of see, because I think a lot of times they just, if they don't, they're not aware of it. I, 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 I'd be curious. I'd be an interesting survey, but you know, as, as you may know, you know, what the elementary school, I was down there twice a week for an hour a day, you know, two, two hours a week when I'm like, you know, middle school, less and less in the high school, you, you draw, you, you drop them off for soccer practice or baseball practice, you pick them up and you, then you go to graduation and done. And so a lot of them don't get very far into it. Certainly in the high school, people don't get very far into the buildings and uh, more so at the elementary, but they're more focused at their kids at that point. So but point taken. Uh, Advocate. Um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll go quick. Uh, I had a couple questions, but first, Andrew, uh, fantastic job. Um, I really like the report, the way it's laid out. Um, so thank you for that, appreciate it. Um, one of the questions I had, uh, Andrew kind of uh, touched on it. So I'm gonna go to the second one. The, you mentioned, um, that you guys are now doing maintenance and um, uh, upgrades throughout the year rather than just summer. Um, and, and you're taking care of, you know, not uh, impeding the current learning and what, what's going on. Um, have you had any, um, I guess, positive comments or negative comments that, that, that's been affecting some or other kids or teachers or principals? Well, I, the only thing I can say is, um, Yes, um, we have the, even even a couple of days ago we were down. I was down talking with Glenn, and we were. Um, he was he he had just mentioned that the they the I think the staff talks more with the head custodians, you know, about what they're but but his his observation was that people have noticed that we've been that there's been some good, very positive changes in the last seven years, and and you know, that, that people are appreciative of it. Um, I'm not sure that was your question. These contractors are good. Like they don't, you don't even notice they're there. Yeah, no, and we're very, and we're, yeah, and we're very conscious of that. We, we, yeah. we don't, we don't send people into our buildings to do work while the kids are in class or whatever. Uh, we've got a really good group of contractors right now that we work with and uh, contractors in general love working in schools. You know, they just, they've got kids they see it as good work. They see it as, as, a, as a great environment. They're able to, if we need them to come in before school starts, they'll come in before school starts. Uh, they'll never, there's never, a, you know, unless a pipe breaks at two o'clock in the afternoon, there's never like a group of contractors working during school. They're either there before school starts or after school gets out or on the weekend or in an area of the building where we know we don't have any students. And we work very closely with the administration and say, hey, you know, you got a heater, bum in that classroom, is there another spot that they can go to for a couple hours while we fix it? Uh, thanks. Yeah, uh, we're, very, we're very conscious of that. Great, uh, Jill, maybe we should probably think about moving to executive session. Yeah, real quick, Andrew, um, hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Um, yep. Yeah, thank you, this is absolutely phenomenal. I think it's immeasurable to, to explain how helpful this is for us as a board. <laughs> 
And just to the rest of the board, I think it's really important that we have this all laid out in one place um, with the projects and the sort of look ahead one place because we really need to stay the course on some of these components. They may not be particularly exciting, but the payoff is a lot longer term. I know that Libby and Grant and Andrew in the past have shown us this kind of calendar of of these improvements like windows, elevator shafts, bathrooms, things like that. And I really want to make sure that we sort of protect that. Um, and also um, knowing that we may as a district um, get more uh, federal funds as a result of this latest I don't know exactly what, you know, state and local and, you know, school governance are going to get for funding, but this would be the first place I think we would look if we ever do have a possibility of some additional funding. The one that, that sort of piqued my interest was the kitchen that seemed like that was a place where there were, I know certainly at the middle school and in other school buildings as well. Um, if the state, um, there's a lot of focus on school lunch programs and then there's federal dollars as well. Like if that's something that as a board, we can kind of help leverage to make some of those improvements using federal funds and why not? So I just, this is, this is an incredibly helpful resource and, and I'll cut it short there, but thank you very much. And Andrew, did you catch all that? Jill, you cut out for about 10 seconds. Um, but I, I think, I think the gist of it came through. Yeah. Yeah. You get, you get me the money. I'll spend it happily. Um, yeah, just one last, one, two last things. You know, this is the picture of the high school. This is the mud lot. If anybody's not familiar with it, this is what we got rid of. It's grass out there. They use it as a, as a play practice field. It's great. The other thing we're doing a great, we're working very hard is this route here. You should never have cars driving around your buildings, your school buildings. Kids are not paying attention. Even at the high school, they're not paying attention. So we've done our, we've gotten rid of this road. We've gotten rid of this road and we're, we're, we, we're trying to break habits that you have to park your car to the very near, very, you have to you have to park your car to the closest door to your room or your space or wherever you're going. Like, it's good to go for a little walk out in the Vermont sun. Um, the last thing I'm going to bring up, and um, there's the new fitness room if no one's been in there. Uh, nice. Um, it's, it, yeah, it's, it, it's quite nice. Um, the one thing at the high school, one of the biggest challenges we have at the high school, the guys, what are the part of that Tom, that, that level of professionalism that Tom has brought to the custodial staff and, um, that he doesn't just hire people, right? He doesn't, he wants people that are going to join this team, stay with the team, engage and be part of it. Um, the high school especially gets used so much. Um, and it's a good thing. It's part of the community. It's a good thing, but it's also a, a, a real burden that we, I think we um, sort of just said, yep, here you go. It's, it's for everybody to use all the time. And I think we just need to be mindful of that, that we had staff, not last fall, the fall before, who would literally go months, you know, with no more than one day off in a row, you know, working 60 hours a week for two months at a clip. And um, we, we, towards Towards uh, in uh, what was it, 19, we said we're not going to rent out on Sundays anymore. We can't do it. We got to let we got to let the guys go shopping with their families for Christmas. You know, <laughs> like so. We at least at, at that one point had had that one day a week. We just said we can't. We can't do it. So it's just mindful. We just need to be mindful as we open the buildings back up and staffing wise. It's, it's if if we have the staff to do it, you know. However, you know it's a great asset to the community. We just need to be. The, the priority for the custodial staff and us is that on Monday morning, when the doors are open, the school is ready for the kids and ready for learning. And um, everything else is, is as after that. The other thing that Tom brought up, and this is the last thing, you know, we, we got away from, we were very conscious at the beginning of this whole COVID thing to not have the sort of deep clean day because Tom's, Tom's direction and philosophy is it's as clean Monday morning as it is Wednesday morning as it is Friday morning. There isn't, there's no need for a deep clean on a Thursday afternoon because it's not dirtier on a Thursday than it was on Monday afternoon. And it's that kind of mindset uh, that has served this, served the, served us well and will continue. And hopefully that's sort of an institutional thing that will carry forward um, past myself, past Tom, past Glenn, past uh, Libby, past all of us, you know. I thought that will just be the way. And I think Tom is well on his way to doing that. Thank you. 
That's it for me. Great. Um, thanks, Andrew. That was super helpful. Um, uh, especially, I think that now with our building facilities committee, we will hopefully be hearing more of these updates. Uh, and I will work with Libby to pick some dates for uh, a safely distanced um, set of building chores uh, for the board um, as we kind of move through the spring and into summer. So. Yep. And like I say, read through it. If there's if there's specific questions, things you don't understand, things that are let, just get them back to me and and uh, and we'll integrate it. And the idea is this is a living document. The, the, the heavy lifting has been done. It should just be updated every year and um, it'll be a good, it'll be a great asset to, to, to continue forward. I bet and this is not this is not me. This is most school districts would most school districts don't do this kind of stuff until they've got a problem. And then they're already two years past trying to solve the problem, needing to solve the problem and not looking ahead. So uh, this is this is a this is a great thing that we have as a district. And uh, this is, is worth the worth the effort. Thanks, Andrew. Great. Thanks, Andrew. All right. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Um, so we're going to have a quick executive session to just get an update on uh, negotiations. Um, what was that? Hi, Tom. Oh, do we have one more? No, you just need a motion to go in executive session. Okay, was like, well, no, we, we first need, need a motion. Two motions, right? We need we need two motions. We need a motion that um, just something to the order of discussing negotiations in public would put the board at a substantial disadvantage. I can try I that. I think is uh, close enough. I, I can try that. I move to okay. find that uh, premature uh, public knowledge regarding contracts with different unions um, would place the district at a significant disadvantage uh, because we. Uh, risk disclosing our negotiation strategy if we discuss the proposed contract terms in public setting. Um, any discussion? Uh, Advocate? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Uh, Kristen? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Mia? Aye. Amanda? Aye. Jill? Aye. Great. So that, <laughs> <laughs> we, we got, I think we heard you the first time, at least. Or it was an echo. Um, so now we just need a motion to go into executive session. Move that we go into an executive session. Uh, do you have a second? I second. Um, Advocate? Aye. Andrew. Aye. Uh, Kristen? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Mia? Aye. Amada? Aye. Jill? Aye. Great. Uh, Olivia, you want to put us into a breakout room, please?